evening. I'm Jeremy Fernandez and welcome to Q&A. Here to answer your questions tonight, the Shadow Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Brett Stevens, who's in Australia as a guest of the Lowy Institute, South Australian Greens Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, Assistant Minister to the Treasurer Michael Suker, and Chief Executive of the Investor Group on Climate Change, Emma Hurd. Please welcome our panel. Q&A is live across Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio at 9.35 Eastern Standard Time. And you can stream us around the world on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. There's plenty to talk about, so let's get straight to our first question from Tony Lee. Thank you, Jeremy. My question to the panel tonight is, most of us know and understand that the exponential price height of energy that is electricity and gas, is due largely to the failure of successive state and federal government to formulate a comprehensive energy policy. This, in turn, has failed to attract the, re uh, the investment required for, uh, for renewable energy. The recent whisper by the federal government to water down the clean energy target will exacerbate what is already a precarious position. When is the government going to cease these politics of appeasement and uh, do the right thing? Michael Suka. Well, Tony, thank you for the question. Uh, the reality is we do find ourselves in somewhat of a precarious position as we've transitioned away from uh, very much carbon intensive uh, energy generation to more renewables. And what we've seen happen is in some respects, some levels of government, particularly uh, state governments that haven't focused enough on ensuring that we've got baseload dispatchable power uh, or that we've got storage and other things that complement renewable energy. Now, uh, you refer to successive governments. We've seen, uh, particularly in South Australia, with probably the most egregious example uh, of energy issues. We've seen a statewide blackout. We've seen successive or a series of blackouts since then. There are two then. South Australians on the panel, so you know. Thank, thank, thank you, and I'm aware of that, and I'm sure that uh, you and Penny uh, will speak to it. But the reality is uh, we've seen a movement towards m more renewables without much thought to uh, how you store it, uh, if any, uh, to ensure that you do have uh, the energy when you need it. Now, South Australia also has, happens to have the most expensive electricity in the country. So the government has a focus. We want to ensure reliability, we want to ensure uh, affordability and of course we want to meet our emissions reduction targets, 26 to 28 per cent under the Paris Accord. Now we are focused on those three objectives. Uh, sadly the Labor Party and the Greens seem to be only focused uh, on the objectives, uh, the environmental objectives. Now the reality is we need to do all three and if you look at Snowy Hydro uh, two, um, that is an example uh, of really significant investment from this government to assure that we do have the storage, the backup that complements renewable energy, but we also need base load power. And that's one of the arguments we've been having in Parliament this week with the Liddell power station in particular, but it's not just about Liddell. Uh, as you see base load energy, particularly coal eggs at the market, you've got to have an orderly transition. And what we haven't seen, particularly from state Labor governments and former Rudd-Gillard Rudd government was enough thought to how you ensure that that transition occurs with ensuring affordability and reliability. We'll come to back to Liddell a little later on. Penny Wong, I want to come to you. Your leader, Bill Shorten, was taking a task last week about well, this I'd contention... Well, can I respond to that? About this, contention, <laughs> ...about this contention that the average Sydney power bill had risen $1,000 under the coalition, which is widely disputed. Why the theatrics? Well, I don't know very many people who would agree with... Was it um, Mr Frydenberg who said that actually your electricity bills have gone down here in Sydney? Uh, I think people know electricity prices are going up. But uh, can, the only thing that Michael said with which I agree is, is this, is that we have an issue with what he described as baseload or dispatchable supply. That's correct. Why do we have that issue? We have that issue because we've had about 4,000 megawatts of power exit the market under this government. We have uh, the majority of uh, the, the plant which generates baseload um, supply is beyond its design life. 
uh, and we have had a lack of investment certainty. And if you're asking people to invest, uh, as we want them to, uh, in long-term, long-lived assets, they need certainty around what the rules are. And we haven't had certainty because we've been in a political conflict for a decade. Uh, and regrettably, um, you know, I was the climate minister when we, when we were unable to get agreement through the parliament. Uh, uh, that's almost 10 years ago now. And, and the cost of that to the community has been less investment in supply, dispatchable, uh, and that means higher prices. So if we're going to resolve this, um, uh, what we have to do is to set aside uh, some of the wars that we have seen over the last decade, which really started when Tony Abbott tore down Malcolm Turnbull in 2009 as uh, leader of the opposition, uh, and come to a sensible, bipartisan agreement that provides certainty to industry so we can get the investment that the country needs. That is, that is the critical first step to making sure we stabilise prices. Sarah hanson Oh Well, look, uh, I think um, Penny's right on, on um, a number of those elements. And the, the truth here is that um, the coalition government have no plan, absolutely no plan, and they're flip-flopped all over the place. And Tony Abbott uh, came in so under this government. Um, they removed the price on carbon. Um, they you know, wrecked it. Uh, then they uh, rejected the expert advice for um, an EIS, an emissions intensity scheme. Um, out of hand, experts said it was a good thing to do. Not, not going near it. Ruled it out. Now they've been there's been a proposal for a clean energy target and they want to wreck that too. They want to make it a dirty energy target. They want to put coal into the mix. Um, you have no plan. And this is part of the problem. Um, a lack of certainty for investment. A lack of certain certainty for investment means um, there is um, a lack of supply. Lack of supply means prices go up. Um, meanwhile, uh, emissions keep rising higher and higher. Um, you know, I, I must say, as a South Australian, I get sick to death of hearing um, people in the federal government uh, continue to whack South Australia <coughs> when we have such a... Um, support in South Australia for our renewable energy industry. Um, we are uh, actually leading the way in many regards. And if your government actually did something to help, um, we would be doing even better, absolutely even better. So, you know, maybe put away the bows and arrows and actually focus on what it is that we need to do. We can reduce pollution and reduce power bills all at the same time. Um, invest in renewable energy, invest in those storage and battery technologies, uh, demand management, uh, and re-regulate power prices. Because you want to know what's really pushed power prices up. It was when state governments um, decided to go around and privatise everything. And that is um, fundamentally the one single thing that we know has made power prices go through the roof. If you really care about power prices, you would regulate them. Uh, Michael, your quick response. Well, can I just say, uh, Sarah, we don't want to take South Australia national. You might be a very proud South Australian senator, but I can assure you we don't want uh, the statewide blackout that you suffered. We don't want the succession of blackouts you had. We don't want the highest electricity prices in the world, uh, in the, in what the country. What do you want, Sorry. though? You've got what no we, plan. I've, I've told what you, do you want? I've told you, very, I've told you very simply. We want affordable electricity. We want a reliable electricity grid, and we want to ensure that we meet our climate targets. And, you want to give, and we are you want to give nearly a billion dollars to keep an old clunker of a coal-fired power station well, open. I don't think that's a formal government continuing policy. To subsidize <laughs> it by, it, Sarah. Continuing uh, to subsidise it by the taxpayer. I mean, okay, the coal right. industry is one of the most over-subsidised industries in this country and it's about time we started looking uh, at a transition to ensure that we have energy of the future. You just want to keep putting Well, can I say that's where we agree. I think that's where we agree. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to bring Brett Stevens in yeah. here. Brett, uh, how much does this sound familiar to you, this sort of discussion, this sort of argument that's happening really around the world. We're actually well, this, polite the, here. This, this sounds more familiar <laughs> to the discussion that's occurring in Germany where uh, investment in renewables, which I think is world-beating um, the so-called uh, energy, energy vendor, um, uh, goes hand-in-hand -hand with some of the highest energy prices uh, being paid anywhere by, by consumers. And the problem is, is very simple, which is that you can have a tremendous amount of investment in renewables and feel very good about it, um, but you need baseload supply. And at least in Germany's case, I, I just don't know what it is in Australia, they found that baseload, baseload supply through the use of um, dirty coal, a cheap 
uh, energy source to make sure that uh, the lights are, are always turned on. I mean, what I don't understand, maybe this is not part of uh, appropriate part of the debate, is why nuclear is not a part of this uh, mix. Um, if you're not going to have nuclear energy, which provides you with endless reliable energy and is extraordinarily safe, um, it is. It's extraordinarily safe compared to other other sources of energy, um, and it's um, greenhouse. It's 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 carbon neutral. It's uh, um, then you're not going to reach your energy goals. You're going to end up having this, I think, sterile argument between dirty coal and sources of renewable energy, which are not going to reach your energy needs. Uh, a lot of this comes down to... to just, it'd be much cheaper to invest in battery storage and demand management systems. And, and there's the in investment future. kind of the capital that you have to outlay. The business community is expressing a lot of frustration about the sort of discussion we're hearing from our politicians. Frustration was certainly the word that sprung to my mind in the last five minutes, I have to be honest, Chair. I mean, I mean is it any wonder that the business community in Australia is at its wits' end mm. in terms of the energy and climate change debate? I mean, not only have we had 10 years of, uh, of, of spinning our wheels in terms of an integrated uh, policy response, which has completely frozen all investment in the energy That's sector, right. no matter what energy source you're talking about, whether it's gas, whether it's coal, whether it's wind, whether it's solar, you're seeing this uncertainty affect energy investment right across the board. But you're also not seeing the kind of long-term planning that you need in an industry as capital intensive as the energy sector. I heard, uh, but it's not just policy that's an issue here. I think we also need to recognise that this is, Australia is not operating in a vacuum. This is actually a transformation that's happening across the energy sector globally. And I actually had a great quote last week where someone was saying that what we're actually seeing in the energy sector has the scale of the industrial revolution, mm -hmm. but it's happening at the speed of the digital revolution. So it's not just a question of picking your winner or picking your technology or picking your energy source. It's actually a question of having a long-term plan which manages the different competing cost and emissions and affordability and reliability issues in an integrated way, which is what we thought we had at the beginning of this year. I want to go to another question from Vijaya Nagarajan on this very issue. Vijaya. Um, yeah. Um, so governments have so many balls in the air and so many interests to satisfy. So should this change actually be driven by superannuation funds and investors? Are they the group that can actually give us an acceptable climate change future? Well, I'm happy for everyone to adopt our plan. That would be a great solution <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Uh, look, I actually do think that uh, in, in investors and superannuation funds have a really interesting perspective on this particular issue because they're not day traders, they're actually long-term okay. investors. So you, you buy and you hold the asset for a long period of time. And you're also managing people's retirement savings. So everyone in this room has got their money invested in a super fund. Uh, everyone in this room has a say in terms of where that money is actually invested. Uh, and, and institutional investors have to be thinking about that broader constituency when making investment decisions. So they're conservative with their risk, they, they're looking for returns constantly, and actually looking to manage climate and energy issues, which is why it's so problematic in terms of investing in Australia at the moment. Uh, Brett Stevens, is it up to business to take the lead on this issue, given the sort of government breakdowns that we're seeing? I think it generally should be up to markets to figure out what technologies work and which ones uh, don't. Um, and generally speaking, at least in the United States, the experience of government interventions picking and choosing which industries are going to work um, have failed fairly spectacularly. I mean, to everybody's surprise, the United States has been able to bring down um, carbon emissions and bring down, uh, bring down the, the price of energy through um, a technology nobody anticipated was going to resolve those problems, namely uh, hydraulic uh, fracking, namely the, the discovery of huge amounts of natural gas and adding it to the energy mix at the expense of coal, which is considerably uh, dirtier. So letting markets figure this out tends to be a better way than asking politicians to pick and choose uh, the technologies of the future. All right, we're going to stay with this theme. Our next question is a video from Newcastle Dr John van der Callen, who's the Chair of Doctors for the Environment New South Wales. Why is health not a primary consideration in the discussion regarding closure of coal-fired power stations such as Liddell, when we know that the pollution from these coal-fired power stations contributes to respiratory and cardiovascular illness as well as premature death. Why are we not planning to close these power stations sooner? Michael Sucker. Well, um, look, of course, we have a suite of uh, 
considerations we take into account with uh, any form of manufacturing or any industry that uh, in some way affects our environment. Now, uh, I said to you at the beginning, uh, and I said to the audience at the beginning, that we are trying to manage three competing objectives here. Yes, of course, the environmental objectives, and uh, really uh, John's question was touching on that, is one very important one. But uh, we do have to manage this transition. And towards the end of Sarah's answer, I spoke about perhaps the ray of light of what we agree on uh, is how we manage the transition. Now, my argument is that the transition has been so poorly mismanaged by the South Australian Labor government, that's the prime example of how we don't want to transition. I mean, we want to ensure that uh, as we are moving to an increasing uh, level of renewables, that we do have uh, the storage capacity. At the end of the day, when the wind is not blowing and the sun's not shining, each of you in the audience and uh, everyone around the country still expects to be able to switch their lights on and know that it's going to be there. And that's what, when we talk about dispatchable power, that's what we need. Now, coal for the foreseeable future will play a role in that. Of course, it's playing a diminishing role over time, but in our lifetimes, it will still play a big role. And the other uh, issue that we sort of touched on just briefly was the issue of gas. I mean, we have abundant gas reserves and resources. Uh, again, I don't want us to be too partisan here. But you're um, about to be. Well, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Penny. Um, but we did enter into some very long-term contracts under the former federal government, which basically means all of our East Coast gas Just now has yeah. been sold offshore. Um, and gas is a very important part of the energy mix for us. In fact, the price of gas almost is the determinant of what the electricity price is given our current mix. So I think uh, all sides of parliament need to get better at how we harness those resources in a way that ensures again, that we meet two of those other objectives, which is affordability and the reliability of our system. Senator Wong, I'll just come to you in a second, but Emma, I want to hear whether business sees it the same way that Michael Suker does. Uh, well, I mean, I guess if you want to look at what the, uh, what the immediate impacts of the health effects of unregulated um, coal-fired generation, then you only have to look to China, which is grappling with some really substantial and, uh, you know, quite dangerous health impacts on the community in terms of not having heavily regulated the coal-fired power uh, industry and not actually managing the health implications of, of, of coal-fired generation. Interestingly enough, it's that very, uh, you know, the driver of managing environmental pollution, which is actually now the basis of so much of China's actions in terms of being a world leader in investing in renewable energy, um, taking up more than 50% of global investment in renewable energy uh, in the last few years. So from the, from, for the question, in terms of the health impacts, I think we absolutely need to be taking into account the, uh, the, the physical effects of different types of energy generation. To, to the question, I, don't, I, I think it's a false choice. We actually have a national electricity market which works across the entire um, eastern uh, part of the country, which actually includes multiple sources of energy and which can be managed in an integrated way. I think if we go down the rabbit hole of choosing to pick a technology, then not only we are we ignoring the the dynamics of the market, but we're also on a road to nowhere in terms of getting that decision right uh, from pricing and take up and a number of other market factors as well. Penny Wong? Well, two, I don't, two points. The first is the government that actually removed export controls on gas was the Howard government in 1997. Uh, and in 2004, your white paper strongly supported the development of an export industry. Uh, you're now pointing to this because to cover up, frankly, the mismanagement of the energy market since that time. Uh, what I would say to you is this. Uh, the last time we had clarity and bipartisanship on uh, energy policy and climate policy was when I agreed uh, a policy framework with the then leader of the opposition, Malcolm Turnbull. And what happened to him? Tony Abbott and the hard right of the Liberal Party tore him down and they have been waging an ideological war in this space for the last almost decade. And, and until we get going. over that, we are not going to resolve the mismanagement of which you speak. Now, we have said... We are willing to have a bipartisan approach to the clean energy target. We'll probably get some criticism from Sarah or others about that. And so far, you have been unable to come to the negotiating table because you're still dealing with an ideological argument of people who just decide that renewables are somehow the end of the world. It's about time everybody grew up. Brett Stevens, there's a... <laughs> there are a number of court cases on foot around the world, notably in California, where governments are suing energy companies for the impacts of climate change. What do you think when a government MP says 
there's a greater role for coal in the future? Um, in some places, there may be a greater role for coal. I mean, you just can't, you can't dictate energy mixes in given, in given na uh, national markets, especially because sometimes turning towards uh, renewables, as is the case in Germany, has led to an increase, uh, paradoxically, um, in, in, uh, uh, in the use of coal. I just think it's extremely dangerous for governments to try to determine what the energy of the future is. If seven years ago you had said to an American politician, the energy that is going to actually reduce your carbon footprint in the United States and is going to transform your national security outlook when it comes to energy is natural gas brought out from shale in places like the Dakotas and Texas, most economists would have told you you were mad, but that's precisely what ended up, uh, ended up happening. So I think there's a slightly sterile argument when it comes to trying to figure out precisely what the energy mix is. And again, always beware of the downside of renewable energy, which seem to have, um, you know, seem to have only an upside, but as, as Michael pointed out, people need the lights to go on even when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. Sarah Hanson Young, are people on your side, the people who are proponents of renewable energy, a bit blind to the negative impacts of it? No, I think actually, in, in, look, renewable energy is incredibly popular throughout Australia. Australians um, get it. They, they want um, to be making energy out of the, the sun and the wind, but they also want to be able to store that. And, you know, Michael's right, the wind isn't blowing all the time, the sun's not shining all the time. If you had the mix of technologies, it would work. Um, what is crazy, and um, I, f I find this extraordinary, you know, we've got a conservative voice from the US saying, let the market decide. And yet here in Australia, we've got um, the conservative government um, wanting to socialise uh, the coal industry. You want to spend hundreds of millions, billions of dollars propping up the coal industry. I mean, no wonder we're in an absolute... Um, you know, funk when it comes to how we deal with climate change and how we deal with energy policy. Coal is dead. It's dead in Australia. Um, trying to keep these clunkers going at huge public expense is just crazy. It's just crazy. And the only reason it's happening is because Tony Abbott uh, is uh, in charge of your government's energy policy. And it's time Malcolm Turnbull stood up to him and said, back in your box, Tony. We're moving on with the future. Well, I've got to respond. I do 25 this. words or less, very, very quickly. Well, can I just say, uh, Sarah, what we do have and what we know is the Australian energy market operator has said we are going to have a shortfall of dispatchable power. That is not an opinion, that is not an argument. Now, the reality is, and what I said, Jeremy, earlier is, yes, of course we're transitioning away from coal. There are some people who want it to happen uh, ASAP, irrespective, get excuse out of me, Sarah, irrespective of the cost and irrespective of what it will do to the security of our system. People like me say, yes, of course we're transitioning away from coal, but let's do it in a sensible way that doesn't put too much pressure on households and also assure, ensures we don't have what happened in South Australia go national because what, what, no one wants South Australia to go national. Well, and what was the single thing in that report which was identified as, a, as the greatest factor around that shortfall? Well, uncertainty. that's a rhetorical question. No, it, is, it was investment uncertainty. And yeah. so if you, if you... I'm sorry, I should let Emma speak. She probably knows much more about it. Well, I was going to say investment uncertainty is a major factor here. But what I was also going to add, though, is um, it's not just households who are also pursuing renewables. Increasingly, what you're actually seeing is business mm. installing on-site renewable energy generation. And they're not doing it because they believe necessarily that coal is dead. And they're certainly not doing it because they're um, picking a, an ideological position on climate change necessarily. Frequently, they're doing it because it's cheaper mm. to, to generate energy on site, particularly if you're in remote mining communities, for example, where you're seeing increasing on site solar generation than shipping in diesel. So, I mean, it's, it's no one size fits all. Uh, it is multiple technologies, multiple sources, and the market is deciding what they prefer. And right, and I want to go a lot another of generators aspect of this yeah. issue. Our next question comes from Jeff Brennan. Yes, uh, I've given that I've experienced uh, Ban the Bomb, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring the oil crisis, the millennium bug, <laughs> and nearly 30 years of anthropogenic climate change theory. I'm still here, life's still good, the world's still a beautiful place. Am I being rational when I feel like a modern-day Copernicus <laughs> trying to stop policy, public policy being built on the climate change bandwagon? 
The climate change bandwagon. Brett Stevens. Look, uh, I think it's inarguable that uh, um, the world has warmed um, since um, we've been keeping temperature records and the scientific evidence that man, humankind is responsible for uh, a large share of that warming, I think, is indisputable. But I think you're pointing to um, a point that ought to be taken on board by sincere and serious uh, climate activists, which is that um, we've had um, ecological alarms, um, as you've pointed out, throughout your lifetime, throughout mine, um, not all of which have turned out to um, be as dire as, as was predicted. I, I, I began cutting my journalistic teeth on something called mad cow disease, which you may remember was going to kill half a million Britons per year, according to um, reputable scientific sources. It ended up being about as bad as a plane crash, which is a disaster, of course, for victims of this variant of creutzfeldt jakob disease, but was not the environmental disaster that was pointed out. I think it's important for climate activists not to overstate claims that then prove false. To give you an example, in 2005, a UN, I think it was a UN panel, suggested that by 2010 there would be 50 million climate refugees. This garnered tremendous um, uh, attention. Of course, nothing of the kind took place. Now, that being said, and I say this as someone on, on the conservative side, the best argument for climate precaution is the same argument you surely have if you live in a house for why you take fire insurance, right? You're not, it's perhaps unlikely that your house will be set ablaze, but because there's a 1% chance that this might happen, you need to invest in, in your fire insurance. At least that's what we do in the United States. The sensible question then is, well, how much do you invest, given that you have limited, limited resources and you have to invest in your health care and, and other things? And furthermore, if you want to take the analogy a step further, what fire insurance do you really want to take out? One of the problems I hear from climate activists is, well, do something. OK, well, great, absolutely do something. But what exactly? Because 15 years ago in the United States, the solution to climate change was biofuels. That turned out to be both an environmental a disaster from an environmental point of view and a disaster from a food scarcity point of view as we moved um, cropland to, to create fuels rather than, uh, rather than fuel. There was something called uh, trading mechanisms, cap and trade schemes, which turned out to be avenues for uh, corruption, at least in the case of Europe. So I think the climate, climate activists owe it to the rest, owe it to themselves and the efficacy of their program to start proposing solutions that have proven results, because a lot of what we've had from them hasn't borne out as they've promised it, as, as they have promised. That's a problem for them, and I'm saying this on their behalf, because otherwise guys like you aren't going to believe you, and, and that's, you need to somehow come to some agreement. Now, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter and keep an eye out on the RMIT ABC Fact Check page and the conversation website for the result. The next question comes from Asan Alhaq. Myanmar's decades-long violence on the innocent Rohingya civilians is no longer just an ethnic cleansing. It is now a genocide. People don't just flee for fun. The Myanmar government deliberately underestimates um, the fatality figures, and there is no access for the international media to question this and report on the horrendous reality. Why has not Australia yet imposed sanctions on its aid agreements, diplomatic relations, and trade relations with Myanmar, despite reports of ongoing human abuse, and more recently, the genocide of the Rohingyas? Penny this question is for Senator Penny Wong. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, first, uh, it was, uh, I think, a, a very important step that the Security Council uh, dealt in part with this matter and, and condemned the violence. We have widespread, credible reports of killings, of violence, people being forcibly removed. Uh, and we, we are rightly and deeply concerned uh, uh, about this. Uh, certainly, uh, the opposition, uh, and I would say also the government, has made clear it's publicly um, our, our deep concerns about these reports. We have urged the government in Myanmar to cease the violence, as has the Security Council now. We have urged them consistently to respect the rights of persecuted minorities and to respect the rights of all citizens and to observe human rights. But your question really goes to what is the best way to give effect to those concerns. Uh, it is, uh, 
I think there is uh, an argument in relation to, I think you said human rights conditions associated with international development. I mean, that's, that is a perennial issue raised with me. And, and the point I, I would make is that there are, um, uh, I think there is an argument that, in fact, what you're trying to do with some of the assistance, and I think that the government has provided some assistance recently, uh, is, is to deal, uh, assist, provide assistance to the very people who you are seeking to protect. Now, uh, I think there is more diplomatic pressure that can be exerted. Uh, in, on the Myanmar government, uh, and we should do that. And we should do that on a bipartisan basis, and we should do that uh, as a country that cares about human rights, and I think, as importantly, has had, has watched the democratic transition in Myanmar and the, 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 the changes which we have seen in that country with a great deal of hope. Arsene, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, thank you for that, Senator Penny. Um, that's right. Australia did uh, recently actually make, an, uh, make a donation uh, of an uh, amount totaling $5 million, which is really minute compared to most of the causes that Australia actually speaks out for, which begs the question that Australia is quite selective with the crises um, and the atrocities that are happening over there. Um, speaking of pressure, yes, Australia has um, made, um, they've represented their concerns, they've talked about it, but Myanmar government's blatantly disregarding it. They still continue to burn villages today as well. And it's not really working. I mean, there should be sanctions imposed to actually p pressurise them. Well, S saying it out loud might not help. <laughs> well, on, on, the international, on the assistance, probably it's a question for Michael, although it's probably not a question in his portfolio. I'd make the observation there's obviously been a very large reduction in the, in the EA program under this government, um, uh, about a quarter of the program has been reduced, so that is going to lessen how much this government can provide anywhere, let alone to particular crises. Um, uh, I think it is an important thing, and I know this is uh, you know, not the sort of immediate resolution that you would want, but it is a very important thing that the UN Security Council has considered this, and we have obviously the UN General Assembly uh, which is meeting in this coming week, and I think there is an opportunity there for the sort of diplomatic pressure to which I've alluded to uh, be brought to bear on this government uh, to end the violence. Michael Suka, from a government point of view, what can be done beyond expressing concern and urging? Well, Asan, I'm, I can understand the urgency that I'm sort of picking up from your question. I, I completely get it. I tend to agree with everything that Penny said on the issue. Uh, sadly, um, going down a path uh, of sanctions at first instance can often hurt the people or hurt other people that we are trying to assist. Now, I, I can understand why you view that as being leverage and pressure that we can put on the government. I mean, what we've seen in Myanmar uh, uh, over many years, I think, has been some encouraging steps. There's been a range of persecuted minorities uh, in Myanmar and we have seen tentative steps towards democracy. Now, uh, Penny referred to the UN, uh, the work of the UN Security Council. Um, there is a lot of diplomatic uh, pressure being put. Uh, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, but I completely get your sense of urgency about it. Sadly, though, I think if we, uh, if our instinctive reaction uh, is one which uh, alienates or makes it more difficult to do work in that country, the very people we're trying to help are the ones that uh, end up being hurt can, the can, most. Can I jump in for one second? I, um, some of my colleagues at the New York Times have made this point uh, very eloquently, but you shouldn't underestimate the moral power of shaming um, Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, people have talked about uh, demanding that her Nobel Peace Prize from, I guess, 1990 be revoked. I don't know if that's possible, but it helps when leading politicians in places like Australia uh, make that argument, because this is really now on her. This is, I don't think you should penalize the people of Myanmar for decisions that their leaders have been making towards the Rohingya actually for, for many years. But you have an opportunity in her to exert moral pressure to change the policy and to do so immediately. Mm -hmm. Sarah Hanson Young, your view? Uh, I actually agree with that, um, and I think um, Aung San Suu Kyi has broken many hearts across the world, frankly. Um, you know, I used to work for Amnesty International when she was a um, um, political prisoner. And um, 
so many people across the world um, fought for her and fought for her freedom. And I think people are just shaking their heads and saying, why? You know, um, can't, you, can't you stand up? There was so much faith put in her. Um, but I come back to what it is that Australia should be doing and can be doing. Um, we need to be doing absolutely a lot more. Um, in 2015, when the last Rohingya refugee crisis, when there was um, 4,000 people stranded at sea in boats that people smugglers had left them there, and Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister, and he was asked by the other countries in the region, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, um, and world leaders um, to play a part in helping. And do you know what he said? Nope, nope, nope. That was, the, that was the comment to helping people. So I hope that we can have a bit more humanity and a bit more um, common sense this time round from Malcolm Turnbull and from Julie Bishop because nope, nope, nope doesn't cut it. Um, Myanmar and Burma is in our region. There are hundreds of thousands of people who are fleeing in the last few weeks, um, families that have been torn apart, children who have been slaughtered. I was hearing the, the figures. Um, 40,000 unaccompanied minors, children on their own in the last few weeks, just being found in refugee camps or, or kind of lost across the border. It is a humanitarian crisis on our doorstep and Australia has to do more. We should help people um, directly through diplomatic um, pressure, but of course we should also open up our uh, borders and resettle some of these people. Um, Australia can't continue to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world and certainly not from our region. So I'd like to see 20,000 places, as we did um, for Syrians and Iraqis during that crisis, I'd like us to do that for the Rohingyas. Let's uh, move along to our next question, which comes from Alexander Lau. Hi. I'm a gay Australian born Chinese man. My mother holds traditional Chinese views and last night told me that she voted yes for marriage equality only because I am gay. While I appreciate that her love for me outranks everything else, it was a painful reminder that my ex many in my extended family don't hold particularly favourable views of the LGBTIQ community and that my relationship is somehow less. This is fairly common in the Chinese community and replicated throughout various other ethnic groups. How can we combat the homophobia found in these communities and ensure that the discussion surrounding marriage equality is focused on the subject of marriage and not conflated with other unrelated topics. Penny Wong. Good. <laughs> well, I hope you're okay, and I hope that you also see her journey. Um, not that I want to talk to you about your relationship with your mother, but um, everybody has, everyone has their own journey on these issues. Um, uh, I think if I can deal with the ethnic community um, or the Chinese community and, and um, the views of some ethnic communities, not all, because I think. Sometimes the community leaders are not speaking for the next generation, as, as is evinced here. Uh, we, we have often argued, certainly those of us who arrived in this country or who have different surnames or look a bit different, we have often argued for treatment on the ba equal treatment on the basis of the principle of equality. We have said in, part, in the past, you know, the White Australia policy was inappropriate. We've said that uh, discrimination on the basis of race is wrong. And we've recently seen, over the last couple of years, a, a, a defence again across the ethnic communities uh, against any watering down of the Racial Discrimination Act. Well, you can't pick and choose equality. You can't pick and choose it. If you, if you believe in the principle on the basis of race or gender, uh, I don't see why it is a principle that is somehow diminished or abrogated because of someone's sexual orientation. Uh, so that's my first point. Um, I think the, the second point, just on the, the marriage equality issue, I think we can just get this done. Frankly, I'm, I'm quite tired of... I, I really like coming on Q&A and I see I got introduced as a friend of Q&A, but I, I don't actually want to have to come on this program and consistently talk about it. So it would be good if we could just get it done. So if everyone could vote yes, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I've often talked in this debate, though, about the difference between the sort of debate you have in the parliament or in the media and the discussion or conversation you have in the schoolyard or with other parents or with people in your community. And, and 
Yeah, the vast majority of Australians are, are fair-minded people uh, and uh, they, are, they believe in a fair go. And uh, how they treat me and, and my family uh, in all of the way, all of the context, childcare centre, um, primary school, et cetera, that we engage with them, uh, demonstrates this, uh, that kind of, that, that inherent fairness. Uh, and I hope that will win out in this debate. It's a pretty hard debate for a lot of people at the moment. As you said, the No campaign is finding every other issue to talk about. Uh, it's a deliberate scare campaign uh, and we, 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 I think it's a tactic Australians are seeing through and it's a really disappointing tactic. You know, can I, can I just add from an sure. American perspective because we did this just a few years ago. Yeah, you're ahead of us. And um, <laughs> uh, it's amazing how everyone is okay and, and now it's completely normal and it's fantastic to see it happen. My youngest child, her uh, closest friend on earth has two dads. They're dear friends of ours. And for my youngest child, she doesn't think twice about the fact that her closest friend has, has two fathers. You know, you made the argument from equality. As a conservative, I make the argument from a standpoint of freedom. People have a right, at least in America, and it ought to be everywhere, to pursue their own happiness. That's fundamental. And by the way, that's fundamentally a conservative idea, that the individual and his or her pursuit of happiness has ought to be the primary concern of a fair-minded uh, government. Government should not stand in the way of your ability to, ch to make the most important decision of your life, which is who you love and to love them with dignity and openness and a sense that this is, this is absolutely okay, for not just for yourself, but for everybody. Michael Suka. Some of your colleagues, Michael Suka, say that people like Penny Wong, people like Alexander, need to, and I quote, grow a spine and stop being delicate little flowers. When you hear a conservative speak about the situation in America, how do you digest that and sell the no side to the electorate? Well, Jeremy and uh, Alexander, thanks for sharing it. I think we do have to bring to this debate uh, a sense of compassion for everyone and their own circumstances. I am going to vote no. I'm a prominent supporter of traditional marriage. And what I'd say to you as far as ethnic communities go is I, I don't think there is a sort of uniform view within any particular community. I think uh, it's potentially as diverse in its range of I'm uh, thinking the Chinese community, and I can think of a whole host of other ethnic communities that are just as diverse as the rest of Australia. And I also would say to you, Alexander, don't, um, don't believe that somebody like me who does support traditional marriage uh, in any way is looking down on you or doesn't think that you have a legitimate relationship. And this is one of the problems that we've suffered in this debate so far. So many people who are going to vote no are very afraid to say so. They get harangued, they get called a homophobe, a bigot. Now, um, I, potentially some people say to them, Jeremy, well, don't be so precious. Um, this is going to be a robust debate. Uh, but my view is uh, those of us who believe very strongly in traditional marriage shouldn't be lumped into the basket that we are somehow uh, hateful or somehow don't view, Alexander, your relationship as being legitimate. Now, can I say there are some very good arguments for same-sex marriage. I mean, the one very good argument, and the conservative, I mean, there's another conservative argument for same-sex marriage, which says we want to promote and support long-term stable relationships. They are often the bedrock of our society. But it's not illegitimate to say the countervailing set of arguments, which in my case mean that I will vote no, are that there are very significant consequences for our country if we vote for same-sex marriage. And it's not illegitimate to raise those consequences. Now, it's like, quite... Like, quite, like quite, what? Well, like, I'll like get what? to it, Sarah. I will get like... to it. I will get to it. I will get to it. All right. We're, we're gonna, we're I've, I've been thing. asked the uh, question. We've got to go to another question from Judy Ma. Judy. Um, yeah. Last week, um, Parliament introduced yeah. legislation to provide safeguards and stop vilification of the um, same-sex debate. In that same week, um, Kevin Rudd's grandson, a supporter of the same-sex marriage vote, was assaulted. And this was widely publicised in the media. 
However, when 25 uh, Sydney University students supporting the no vote were assaulted last Thursday on campus by fellow, fellow Sydney University students, this went unreported by mainstream media. What do you say to this? And can you, see, can you not see how this is just an example of how biased the mainstream media is on this issue? Sarah hanson <laughs> Look, I don't condone violence in any um, respects and it doesn't, doesn't matter what side of the debate you're on, you're not, you're not winning if you have to throw punches, OK? Um, so that kind of behaviour from any side isn't acceptable. Um, but I take issue with the idea that somehow uh, there is a, a bias in the coverage here. W what has happened is that the Australian people have, over time, grown to support, um, overwhelmingly, marriage equality. Um, the notion that it um, doesn't matter what gender you are, um, if you're in a loving, committed relationship, um, you should have the right to marry. That is what the question is. Um, I know it is what the question is, because I've, I've filled out my survey and I, and I, know, I know that's the question that every um, person who is registered to vote is going to be asked. Um, yes or no? Um, do you allow... Uh, do you think it's right that same-sex couples should be allowed uh, to marry? Um, I do very proudly. Um, and many, many Australians have come along that journey to do that. And I think that is what you're seeing, is a shift in support. Um, and thank goodness, because um, for far too long, members of the LGBTI community have um, sat in silence and been tried, treated as second-class citizens. And um, I think it's, it's time we ended that. I, I look at my daughter, she's 10, and um, I took her to the um, big rally that we had in Adelaide on the weekend. Um, and we're driving in the car on the way to the rally and she said, Mum, I don't, I don't understand. Why... Wh aren't they allowed to marry anyway? Like, people... She's got friends whose parents are of the same sex. Um, kids don't see that discrimination. Younger people um, don't see that discrimination. Um, it's time that we uh, got rid of it and uh, allowed for... Uh, people to pursue their own happiness, uh, well, let's to, become, to... To, to become uh, legal under the law and to have what is a very personal relationship between two people celebrated by their friends and their family. That is what this is actually about. So, Alexander, you've been listening to all this. What do you make of the responses you've heard so far? Um, I want to touch on Michael's point about how he voting um, no is not a reflection of his opinion about my relationships. Of course I when I go to family functions, my relatives don't ask about my relationships because they're uncomfortable about the idea of it. They don't openly... Ho they're not hostile to my relationships or me as a person. They'll chat about other things, but... And in their way, it's accepting my sexuality in their own way. However, my sister or my cousins, if they're seeing someone new, they'll have conversations with my aunts, uncles, cousins about their relationships. So in that sense, you voting no is really a reflection of my relationship because what you're saying is that I'm not allowed to have a marriage or I'm not allowed to have a relationship that is worthy of marriage because that is something that only you can have as a, in, as a person in a relationship of opposite sex. So when you do go to cast your ballot of no, you are saying that your relationship is worthy of marriage and mine is not. Okay. <laughs> Alexander, Alexander Ju Ju Judy touched on some of the countervailing arguments for why, quite frankly, millions of Australians will eventually vote no. We've already seen in this debate, uh, we've seen anybody that holds a contrary view to you being shouted down. We saw it at Sydney University. We saw a doctor, Dr Pansy Lai, not having her freedom of sp speech threatened, having her livelihood threatened with a petition to have her deregistered uh, as a doctor. Just today I saw news reports of uh, an employee or a contractor being sacked because they had written on Facebook that they will be voting no, these are the things that are legitimate concerns. And for many parents, another legitimate concern is what their children will be taught in a same-sex marriage world in sex ed and oh. gender theory. This uh, is really schools. shameful. I can tell you right I, now. Well, really let me, shameful. Well, let me finish. Penny, please, let me really finish. It is really shameful for you to use that argument. Well, it, Penny, it let, me, let me finish. 
some proponents argue that it's got nothing to do with one another. I saw a same-sex marriage rally last weekend and very prominently on the first banner that was there was support safe schools. Now that is the proponents of the Yes campaign. That is the... Pro so let's just have the discussion. Now at this point but in time... But that isn't what is on the well, ballot Sarah, at this point in time the Yes campaign refused to engage. And so people like me get even more nervous because they're not even willing to accept that they are legitimate concerns. And I can tell you right now, millions of Australians, particularly parents with school-age students, and I'm a member in Victoria who's seen firsthand some of the th things that are taught in the Safe Schools program that I would be too embarrassed to speak about in an audience of adults. Emma, You're Emma, I want to bring Emma yeah. Hurd in here because regardless of all the feelings that are taking place here, there is a very strong business case being made about why big corporations, airlines, banks are getting behind the Yes campaign. What is in it for them? Oh, can I just comment first as well? I mean, I really, I really, really hope that in Australia we do have a respectful cam uh, conversation about this particular issue and that I really, really hope that it is solely about the question of uh, changing the law back in terms of allowing same-sex marriage, because it was actually only changed a few years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, to, to, to be John exclusionary. Howe. So I, I actually think that the majority of the community recognise the inherent rights of everyone to get married if they so choose. And, and I really hope that the conversation that we have rises to the challenge of being respectful and accommodating of everyone's beliefs. And that includes voices from the, the business community. I mean, people who are speaking from the corporate sector are people. I know it's shocking sometimes to remember. <laughs> Corporate CEOs are people. They have strong personal held views as well and they are allowed to express them in a free society. But in terms of what the business case might be, I actually think that, um, you know, historically business has continued to play an important role in the national conversation around what kind of society we want to have. And this is another dimension of that. You actually want a society which is equitable and where everyone's rights are respected regardless. Right, we're gonna, we're business leave, is allowed to say that. We're going to leave this this issue here because otherwise we'll be here till Thursday. Our next question comes from Lisa Bunham. Um, hi, this is for Brett Stevens, and I'm voting yes, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Brett, as a Mexican born American Australian, uh, my question revolves around human capital. Um, in your New York Times column, you reaffirmed that a better measure of national greatness is the ability of nations to cultivate, attract, and retain human capital. If Trump is the hotshot business visionary he purports to be, it simply doesn't make good business sense to send that many deferred action for childhood arrivals, or the dreamers, the Latinos, um, away. How then can we as nations improve on making the following connections? Human capital is good business, which equates to innovation, which we also purport to be, innovative and ultimately economic benefit. So Brett, just take us back on this issue a bit. This is about the dreamers. These are the undocumented uh, child arrivals. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this story about and why has Donald Trump done a deal with the Democrats? Well, actually, Trump, by accident, has done the right thing. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but we'll see uh, how long that, that lasts. Um, Lisa, un placer en conocerte. It's good to be uh, to meet a fellow Mexicano. Um, uh, look, the, the story is, as, as um, undocumented immigrants came to the United States, many brought their children at a very young age. These children, even if you say their parents have committed a crime by violating the immigration laws of the United States, these children certainly never committed any crime. There are 800,000 of them. Some of them are still children. Some of them have become adults. And they want to participate in the American uh, dream. And uh, under President Obama, we had what amounted to an executive order or a, a program to allow these children to continue to work and study in the United States. Now, there's a legal issue about whether they should remain as part of an executive order or actually have uh, legislation to normalize their position in society. Now, obviously, I would favor uh, a legislative program that would would um, uh, would give them uh, the comfort of knowing that their life doesn't hinge from you know administration to administration as to whether they can stay or are going to be forced to return to countries they barely even know. But to your your larger question, Lisa, you know, um, in the United States, something like forty percent of all Fortune 500 companies um, 
are founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. At least in the American experience, it's the immigrants who perhaps want it that much more and work that much harder. Um, and you see that in the economy. More than 30% of, uh, of our Nobel Prize winners um, are themselves immigrants. In fact, if we hadn't had immigrants this last go around, only Bob Dylan would be represented among, <laughs> among the American, not, he's, he's not nothing, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, we wouldn't have had a Nobel Prize in economics. I don't think we'd have one in, in biology and chemistry either. And I think what's true for the United States is also true for a country like Australia. Are you attracting human capital or are you repelling it? Uh, a country like Hungary is, has had various winners of the Nobel Prize. They all leave the country, uh, which tells you something about Hungary's ability to hold on to its, maybe you might say, its, its, its best people. One important point, and I think this is an argument that needs to be clear, is that uh, people say, well, I'm for immigration, but I'm for good immigration, which is to say, you know, uh, PhDs and engineers and so on. My mother arrived in, this, in, in the United States with $7. She was a refugee, um, uh, a displaced person after World War II. Um, this was not a PhD person. And yet, within the space of a generation, people accuse her son of being a hopeless, out-of-touch elite. And I think that's kind of the greatness of the United States. I hope, I hope it's the greatness of Australia, too, that you recognize that in the poor people who are coming here and struggling to make ends meet, those, you know, the, the hungry and tired, um, that their children are going to be your future, your innovators, your entrepreneurs, your, your politicians. Countries that understand that principle thrive. Countries that reject that principle decline. Mm. Uh -oh. I didn't realise we were going to agree on so much tonight. Um, uh oh. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think we actually have to rethink um, the way we talk about uh, immigration in Australia and, and the human capital that we attract um, here. Um, the story that, um, you know, you were telling about the... Um, uh, South American kids, very similar to um, the kids who grew up here um, from Vietnamese families who were resettled um, after the Vietnam War. Um, incredibly hardworking families whose children have grown up to be doctors, nurses, some of the most uh, amazing surgeons in this country, um, comedians, authors. Uh, and the, the same is true for um, every wave of migration that we have had. And I must say, uh, in the uh, kind of uh, pushback uh, to multiculturalism and uh, immigration in Australia from those like Pauline Hanson and One Nation. I think we do need to tell those stories much um, prouder and much louder and be able to say, look, we are a thriving nation because of the people who have been welcomed here, who've chosen to make this country their home and have made Australia great because of it. Um, it's, uh, it it's a tapestry of all of those efforts, uh, not just because um, people were given um, a handout. Actually, they came and really uh, contributed to this country and, and continue to do that. I don't think uh, shutting our borders and saying no uh, is going to drive us into the future. In fact, it's going to keep Australia backwards. One sentence. I promise. Please, yeah. I think <laughs> an Australia that is open and engaged will be a stronger and more dynamic Australia, a more successful Australia, and an Australia that is inward-looking and fearful will be a diminished Australia. It's true. Michael, are we inward-looking or are we outward-looking? I think we're, we're very outward-looking and I, hopefully this is one area of bipartisanship on the panel. I mean, I'm the son of a Lebanese migrant and I'd actually agree, Lisa, with one of your points, which is often it's the, the next generation, the children of migrants who, uh, who really appreciate what they have and they've seen how difficult it was for their parents to give them opportunities that they never had. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't apply to the rest of the country as well, but it certainly means that uh, we do have often uh, a next generation who do incredible things. And I think we are outward looking. And I agree with Penny's point. That's what we want to be. We have a, a, an intake, an immigration intake of uh, just shy of a couple of hundred thousand per annum, which is pretty big uh, on a per capita basis. And uh, if you look at the contribution that they have made uh, over successive generations. It's been fantastic. And 
I don't think, Sarah, there are many people who don't accept that we are a migration uh, nation. Uh, what Australians do expect, though, is uh, that we do have... Uh, that we have an orderly way in which we invite people to join our country. I that's think, I think that's the one. That's generally the one uh, thing that people insist. But in my interactions, I think we are very. Yeah, I, I think on the broader migration point and the openness point, though, it would be good if more in the government perhaps could confront some of the Hanson messages. I think there is a leadership role government should play, uh, and at times I think the government allows. Senator Hanson's messages of fear, much more prominence and much less opposition than there ought to be. Well, today she's out blaming uh, traffic congestion on the M1 in Brisbane because of uh, migration. I mean, this is... A, well, <laughs> she, you know, if, if it rains tomorrow, it'll be... Uh, it'll either be the gays' fault or the migrants' fault. <laughs> it's just... It's, oh, it, I, she's loony. It's all my fault. Emma, can I, can I... <laughs> Emma, Emma, your view. Well, I mean, I, I guess I'd challenge the prevailing notion that we are incredibly attractive as a nation for incoming talent in Australia. I actually think we've done a bit of a disservice to ourselves over the last few years in positioning ourselves as a really attractive workplace for for migrants. And, I, and I'm not talking about uh, uh, refugees here necessarily. I'm actually talking about a human capital from that professional sense as well. I think we're very outward looking in the sense that no matter what industry, what company, what country you go to anywhere in the world, you'll find an Australian working there. Mm. I think that's definitely true. But what I fear is that perhaps it's all that traffic is one way yeah. and we're not necessarily attracting the best and the brightest who want to come here and work mm. in Australia as well. All right, we have time for one last web question from Chris Round of Bellevue Hill in New South Wales. He asks, why do the government and opposition keep saying that we can't let the terrorists win yet go and erect an enormous 2.6 metre high fence around Parliament House, a public building that's supposed to be the symbol of our freedoms? Surely this is proof that the terrorists are actually winning. Michael Suker. Well, Jeremy, can I say uh, it's not uh, lightly that the decision was taken to, to erect that fence in Parliament House. I mean, one of the beautiful things about our Parliament is the figurative idea that the people who walk up the hill on the lawns of Parliament House mm. are literally standing above us, oh, standing in, uh, above Penny and I, and it's quite a, quite a powerful symbol. The reality is, though, in light of what we saw with particularly the attack on the Canadian Parliament, it uh, caused us to... Uh, have a look at every aspect of the security. And, uh, clearly not an easy decision, but one that we had to take because it is, you know, it's no doubt um, the type of target that would be attractive to terrorists and one that sadly we have to take mitigating measures to ensure that we protect uh, not just people like Sarah and Penny and myself, but protect the hundreds of people that work at Parliament as well. As someone who grew up in Canberra, I think, though, that the nation is going to suffer a massive loss from losing the ability to roll, roll down, down the grass the hill. Of the hill on the top of Parliament House. I mean, I think that's a rite of passage for every, any school kid that's been forced that's to right. go to Canberra to go to Parliament House. Mm. And I also think that anyone who's seen the fence will be quite shocked. Yeah. Uh, because now that it's actually going up, it's very in your face. It, it's not a pretty sense. fence, but Penny Wong, do you feel safer? No, I mean, I... I... <laughs> uh, look, look... It's not a decision I, I particularly um, uh, like, but it is a decision that was supported by uh, the major parties on the basis of security advice. Um, there's really... Uh, and I agree, I, I understand those who look at it and say it's a... And I saw certainly it was a bit of a shock when you actually saw it going up. It, you know, I was like, oh, really? Is that what it looks like? So I can understand why the public are, are, are uh, making some of the comments that you are. Well, oh, oh, oh. I, I didn't vote for the fence to go up, and the, the Greens didn't. Um, ha however, um, you know, all of the security advice was uh, was apparently there. But look, I do think it's a bit over the top, and I must say, I'm m more worried about who's being locked in now um, <laughs> than the people on the outside. It's your mob. Yeah. Well, I t look, there's there's a few in that chamber that I think. Mm. <laughs> know where the exit door is, well and truly. A uh, big fence around the White House? Uh, there's been one for a while. And look, uh, just because you erect fences doesn't mean the terrorists are winning. It means you're taking sensible precautions for your own security against a threat that you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't blink at. Um, that being said, ultimately, the best defence against uh, domestic terrorism 
it goes back to the discussion we were having earlier, which is to make sure that as you welcome, um, especially uh, immigrants, you make sure that they are assimilating the uh, democratic and liberal values of their society, which involves tolerance, respect, especially for parliamentary institutions and for uh, human life. Um, and if you're doing that, then, then you're succeeding. I mean, the problem that you've had in Britain uh, recently and uh, to some extent in the United States also revolves around the children of, of uh, immigrants um, who, whose parents were very happy to come here from whether it was Pakistan or Syria or whatever, but whose children never feel quite at home in an Australia or a Great Britain or, or United States. So there's an assimilation issue that needs to be, I think, addressed at least as forcefully as putting up a fence around your parliament. Perhaps some of our politicians not wearing the burqa in the, in the Senate chamber might help that too. And, uh, you know, the, the, the um, whole idea of uh, isolating and making a group of young people in particular feel less connected um, to their broader community is absolutely dangerous. And I think uh, we do have to do um, much better um, at making sure that people feel um, that, that, welcome and safe. That was an example, though, I have to say, notwithstanding my earlier criticism, where I thought, you know, the government through Mr Senator Brandis, I can't believe I'm going to say in something like <coughs> George Brandis, um, <coughs> Senator Brandis said the right thing that day. Yeah. And, yeah. and we responded, and I think there was a strong kind of... You don't use the Senate chamber for those kinds of political stunts in that way. All right, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Penny Wong, Brett Stevens, Sarah Hansen, Yana, Michael Suter and Emma Hill. Remember, you can continue the discussion now on Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook with Tracy Holmes and commentator and columnist Andrew P. Street. Next week, Q&A will be taking a break. In its place, Unconquered, a documentary showcasing the inspiring stories of Australian competitors at the Invictus Games, which kick off this weekend in Canada. Tony Jones will be back with Q&A the following week on Monday, October the 2nd. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Thanks for joining me. Good night. <laughs>